GSPRL supports, uh, you know, subsonic solutions for both the VOM and the paddle solver. The VOM um, supports supersonic Mach numbers. So you could uh, create a, a vortex lattice model and run it both subsonic and supersonic. We've got some simple viscous drag predictions for both wings and bodies. Um, the steady state solutions, and that kind of shows the picture down in the lower right. Um, we have adapted wakes, so those wakes are adapted to obviously the impacts of the wings, the bodies, but also of rotors, in this case actuator discs that are modeled here on the, the DEP geometry. And I just forgot to mention, you know, so the upper right is kind of a, you know, typical vortex lattice model, basically potato chip models, thin surfaces for wings and bodies, and then you got the full up panel type geometry um, in the middle picture. And then the code is also, uh, it can run obviously, uh, you know, steady state type solutions, but it's also has a time accurate analysis with time stepping wakes. So vortex ring, so based, whether you're running the vortex lattice or the panel, um, the geometry is made up of basically vortex rings, whether those be triangles, quadrilaterals, or in general, uh, you know, basically n-sided polygons. Um, so for the vortex lattice, you're typically going to see triangles and quads. Um, for the panel, you'll see, you know, more polygons that are generated um, at intersections where it basically merged a bunch of funky intersection triangles into a single polygon. So vortex lattice method, so you have some geometry here, the, this F15-ish geometry um, within OpenBSP. And so again, we're relying on OpenBSP to generate these geometries. We're not doing it within the tool itself. Um, we generate what we call a degen geom or degenerate geometry. Rob may have already talked about that. I haven't moved to the schedule. Um, but basically, it, it's a potato chip representation of the geometry. So wings get reduced down to thin surfaces that basically model the twist and camber of the wings. Fuselages get reduced down to cruciform type geometries, which take into account, you know, camber on, on the fuselage and obviously the, the profile shapes from the top and bottom, or sorry, the, the top and side. Panel methods. There's a couple ways you could generate these. Typically, I think we basically use just the CompGeom tools, which basically just take your wireframe geometries like you see on your left there that you'd see with an OpenVSP, and it just does a you know brute force intersection of those um, and dumps out a you know closed, triangulated, you know, watertight surface that BSPRO then reads in. Um, and there's going to be a lot of you know bad triangles at the intersections between components. VSPRO goes through and basically tries to you know remove a lot of those bad triangles and merge you know triangles into quads and triangles and quads into polygons to try to come up with a better computational mesh. But ultimately, it's driven by your parametric model and that you know all those intersected surfaces. So those are kind of the two paths that you have. You have a vortex lattice path and a panel path. Um, and generally speaking, I would say start with the VOM model, the, the Vortex Lattice model. Um, it's going to run faster. It's probably going to give you 90% of what most people care about in terms of lift drags and moments. Um, and it's a bit more robust in terms of, you know, let's say quirks in your geometry and the way intersections can come out or the way wakes might be handled in the, vort in the Vortex Lattice versus a panel. And then just from a solve standpoint, you, you essentially have twice the number of panels um, on a panel type geometry versus a vortex lattice. So it's just going to take longer to run. So agglomerated multipole, I'm not going to spend too much on this, but basically the idea is that you know you we read in a geometry, whether that be a degen degenerate geometry or a full up panel geometry, and we automatically generate coarser meshes. So basically, we agglomerate or merge vortex loops into larger loops, and then recursively do that all the way down to you know some stopping point. And then when we actually evaluate the equations that we're solving, basically tangency bounded conditions on every surface. So you have to generate influence. Um, matrices, um, instead of it being an n-squared process, it becomes an n-log n log n process. 
So it's not quite linear, but it means if you double the number of panels in your model, instead of the solution time going up like n squared, it's going to go up more like n log n, which is, you know, nearly linear and about the best you can do for these types of methods. So what does that mean? Um, just, you know, brute force case, we have 3,000 tries, basically just doubling the resolution in each direction. So we're going from three to 12 to 48,000 to 200,000 to almost 800,000 triangles. Um, it's kind of an eye chart on the left and it's in log scale. So it, you know, doesn't look as bad as it really is, but the light blue, and I don't know if you can see my cursor or not there, Brandon, but the, the light blue line here is basically the solution times that you would get, and this is using four CPUs, um, if you ran basically kind of just a brute force VOM type model where the solution times goes up like N squared, right? So this is, you're on the order of, you know, this is a thousand, this is 10,000 seconds, or so on the order of 5,000 seconds. Or you could do something, you know, where you're running, you know, four CPUs and you could go down here with the multiple method and you're well under 100 seconds, right? And, and these are actually old results. The code actually runs a little bit better than this nowadays. So the, the point is, is that, you know, you can start, you know, I don't re recommend running 760,000 triangles on, on a wing, but if you want to go ahead. Um, but the point is that you can start refining your model. And more importantly, you know, you can have a complex model where you have multiple wings, tails, bodies, nacelles, pions, engines, you name it. And as you increase the complexity of your model, um, the solution times are going to go up like n log n. So it's kind of a reasonable penalty to pay um, as opposed to n squared, which quickly becomes just undoable. So Changers under the hood. So yeah, that's pretty much all I'm going to talk about in general about VS Piero. Um, I'll leave it to the other talks that are going on in terms of how it's used and integrated with OpenVSP. But in terms of changes under the hood, over the last year, there's been a lot of stuff that's going on. I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but uh, the one of the big ones that you know people will probably have noticed already and probably will have you know confusion is just in proof force and moment calculations. Um, so there's basically two ways, well there's more than two ways, but there's multiple ways to calculate the forces and moments once you have a solution from a vortex lattice or a panel method. Um, and so the main method that's in there now that we're relying on is basically based on the Kudin-Joukowsky theorem. And it's done on an edge by edge basis. Um, and so to do that, you basically have to explicitly evaluate the downwash velocities from all the other edges onto each edge. Um, and we were trying to avoid this because it's just more costly. So there's basically, you know, the method that was in there before, which is the third bullet there, basically this trailing edge method, um, which is the CDT coefficient that's written out by VSPRO. And that basically used like a, a trust plane type analysis. Um, and you still had to calculate, you know, basically downwashes, but it was only at the trailing edge. Um, it's actually quite accurate, but unfortunately, it's really only applicable um, essentially for steady state solutions and, you know, for uh, non-rotating, non-moving body uh, flow cases. And we are moving the code in to be able to do unsteady flows and, and powered flows. Um, with either actuator discs or, you know, full up unsteady rotor models. Um, and so we really needed to move to the Kedichikowski method. Um, and so we spent a lot of time trying to make that uh, as fast as possible. There's still some stuff in there that we could probably do. Um, but basically relying that on that as the, kind of the main uh, method to calculate the forces and moments. And so that's going to be a big difference. Uh, for some users when they look at the outputs and, and what's being presented in OpenVSP from a run. So there's there's multiple drags that are being, you know, are there that you can take a look at. Um, generally speaking, if you're, you're doing steady state results on, you know, vortex lattice, simple geometries, wings, wing body, things like that, the drags from both the trust plane analysis and from the Kudin-Joukowsky theorem should uh, basically be in the same ballpark, you know, very close. And if they're not um, for, you know, relatively simple geometries, you know, like wing body type cases, 
and you probably want to sit down and think about what's going on. Um, you might have two cores of mesh because the truss plane generally can get away with coarser meshes. Um, you might have interference between components that is just numerically causing kind of garbage in your flow field. So, you know, I, I think that the truss myth is very useful there, uh, especially for some of these simple test case sanity check cases to make sure that, you know, you're getting what you think you get before you start adding in more complexity like actuator disks or doing unsteady flows and things like that. The next big change under the hood um, is basically VSP Geom. So right now we mentioned that there's two formats that we can read in, um, or two methods, basically the panel and the vortex lattice. On the vortex lattice side, we're using the degenerate geometry format that's written out by OpenVSP. And on the panel side in the past, we were using basically the CAR 3D tri files. Um, the new version is reading in VSP geom files for the panel solves. Um, this essentially has the same type of information. It's basically just the intersected triangulated surfaces. Um, but uh, Rob goes in and finds the trailing edges, um, whereas before I had to kind of like back those out from, you know, looking at tests of, you know, what is sharp and what is sh not sharp and what looks like it's pointing, you know, in, basically, you know, on the trailing edge of a wing, because I really didn't know what was a wing and, and what was, you know, not a wing. And so a lot of that is being done within OpenVSP, where Rob has more knowledge about where the geometry is coming from. Uh, we're both working towards basically moving the vortex lattice method over to the VFP geom file format, because it's general enough to support both thin surfaces such as the vortex lattice method as well as the thick geometries that the panel method uses. And Rob has kind of an initial uh, you know, support for doing thick thin geometries with an open VSP. We both need to work on stuff to support that within VSP Aero. But the goal is that you'll be able to run just like you can now the vortex lattice method. So basically what we're calling the thin mode. Um, you can run panel models like you can now, but you also in the future be able to run basically thick thin mode panel VM. So you'll be able to say model the fuselage as a, a panel geometry, model the wings as vortex lattice thin surfaces. Um, and this has a lot of benefits from, you know, computationally, uh, the VOM is just a lot easier to solve. Um, it's going to be a lot faster to solve, and and sometimes you don't have things like the airflow information. Um, so going all the way to a panel solve, um, while in theory is more accurate, if you don't really have the right airfoil and you're just kind of like getting close, then it may not be worth the extra computational expense to to solve in thick mode for a wing. Um, and the vortex lattice, you know, may give you the 90% solution for half the cost. Finally, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the adjoint. I've got a whole set of slides for that, um, and that's basically the, the gradient calculations, and then new bugs and probably new new bugs. Um, and so, like I said, I, I already found something that I didn't mean to to break. And I know Rob, I think, said, told me he broke something in, in the current release that has to do with the outputs to VSPR. So I think there'll, there'll be a, an update there at some point. Um, the, yeah, so it's moving on. So adjoints, uh, I, I can't go through a, a talk without having the gratuitous equations. So I apologize to probably most of the people in the group. Um, but adjoint, so you know, whether or not you're solving CFD, you know, high fidelity like CART 3D, oil equations, Narbridge Stokes, or in the case of VSP, you're, you're solving the, you know, simple, basically a continuity equation. You know, it's it's basically a parent of equation. You've got some residual function in our case, the residual, it's a, it's a function of the circulation strength gamma. So there's a gamma associated with each vortex loop, and then you've got the, the mesh vector X sub I and you're driving that residual to zero. So you're solving some linear or nonlinear system. Um, and so, you know, for a fixed geometry, you know, we have basically, you know, a mesh with M, you know, vortex loops. So we have, you know, 
1 through M and new values of the circulation for each vortex panel. Um, we can take the derivative of that residual, respect the mesh, expand it out there, so you end up partial respect to the mesh, and then you get the partial respect to the solution times partial solution respect to the mesh. That has to still equal zero. You can rearrange that and, and, and basically just you know solve for the partial of the residual respect to mesh. And so that, that basically is you know proportional to the partial residual respect to the solution gamma. That's just the Jacobian vector, a matrix. And then you get this term D gamma dx. Um, you know, so we can we can solve for that that right hand term that d gamma dx, just basically inverting the Jacobian matrix, that dr d gamma, and so now we have an expression for d gamma dx. And then you know, getting into the whole adjoint slicks, you know, assume we want to maybe minimize vehicle drag, and so you know, cd drag coefficient, it's going to be a function obviously of the solution and the mesh, right? So you could tweak the mesh, you know, you'll get a new solution, but that'll adjust the drag. But and also for a given mesh, change the free stream angle attack, uh, Mach number, uh, that's going to change the solution on that given geometry. So, you know, the, the drag is a function of both. And, you know, assume we have some set of open VSP parameters. So those could be the mesh nodes, that could be twist, span, you know, sweep. It, it's just some number of parameters. And in general, what we've basically fallen down to is just basically the mesh nodes, so the actual locations of the nodes uh, of the mesh that comes out of OpenVSP, you know, the X, Y, and Z coordinates of every node. So you can basically take the derivative of that functional uh, CD, so DC, DX is it's the partial respect to the mesh, and then you got the partial of respect to the solution, and again, that partial of the solution respect to the mesh. But we saw for that earlier, if you're following all the equations, we could substitute that to that, and that's the term in the bracket. Um, you do a little bit of rearranging, and you get the, the term in the brackets here on the, the third line. Um, and we can define that, everything in the brackets, as this, this vector psi transpose. Uh, and it doesn't seem like we've done anything, but you know, so psi transpose is just equal to that stuff in the brackets, this partial CD respect to gamma times d gamma, dr d gamma inverse. Uh, if, if we do some, you know, magic algebra, you can rearrange that. So you basically have to take a transpose and an inverse. Um, but you can basically come up with this equation for that, that vector psi, right? So we remember, we define this whole thing in bracket as psi transpose. So you come up with what's called the adjoint equation. So it's dr to gamma transpose. So this is basically, this is the Jacobian uh, matrix, but the transpose of it. So Jacobian transpose times psi equals the partial CD uh, with respect to the solution transpose. So this is the adjoint equation. So if you solve that adjoint equation, you can plug it back into this sucker and you can basically calculate the gradients, you know, the partials of, in this case, CD respect to all the mesh nodes for the cost of one gradient solution or one adjoint solution, right? So that's what I kind of point out below. So that's the reason why we go down this path is that typically if you wanted to calculate gradient, say the partial of CD respect to wing sweep, you could run VSP era, you could perturb your geometry and open VSP, you know, adjust the sweep by, you know, some amount, rerun the solution and do a finite difference. Uh, if you wanted to do that for thousands of different parameters, um, then you'd have to run thousands of VSP error solutions and that would get costly very quickly. And so with the adjoint, we can basically do that for the cost of a VSP error solution and the cost of an adjoint solution. And the adjoint solution it costs on the order of the VSP error solution. So um, essentially for the cost of two VSP error solutions, um, you can essentially get as many gradients as you want because um, really the cost is independent of the length of your you know, parameter list. So the adjoint, um, again, so it, we have an adjoint formulation for the efficient gradient, uh, cal gradient calculations. Um, to do that, we have to do some automatic differentiation within the, the solver. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but for those who care, we're making use of the ADEPT C++ library. This basically does operator overloading 
so that all the doubles in the code became adept doubles. And so adept basically keeps track of not only, you know, basically all of the, you know, double calculations. So if you got y equals x squared, it obviously it does those calculations, but it also keeps track of essentially the partials. So partial y, partial x is equal, you know, 2x if y equals x squared, for instance. So it's keeping track of all of that. And that's used in formulating the adjoint formulation that I just kind of went over quickly. Uh, we're relying on the VSPM uh, mesh file format uh, since that provides me basically with a mesh directly right out of OpenVSP. Um, the current solver runs in parallel, it always has. Uh, unfortunately, right now the adjoint solver is currently single core. Um, that's not a huge hit. Um, it, it, the adjoint solve still is quite fast. Um, we've moved everything up onto NAS Developer, so if anybody here is from NASA and wants access to the code um, base, it's on uh, the NASA Developer, basically the NASA GitHub page. Um, that's all internal. Um, Rob, who's always smiling at this point, knows that I've also been pushing stuff up to GitHub. Um, so I, I have to kind of keep the two things separately uh, just so that I don't accidentally upload something that I'm not supposed to. Um, core solver uh, and the adjoint solver can both be run standalone or, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, basically a C++ API. We've also developed a complex step version of VSPRO uh, for the adjoint, basically doing adjoint validation work. So I'm not going to go into complex step, but let's just say it's kind of like doing finite differences without all the sucky part of finite differences. Um, so it, it still requires you to basically run VSPRO for each and every gradient evaluation. So if you've got a thousand different parameters, you still have to run VSPRO a thousand times. Um, but it doesn't have the issues of choosing, you know, a step size that you would on a finite difference and, and worrying about um, round off error. So the API um, that we've developed, I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, it supports scalar and vector objective functions. So I, my example earlier was, you know, your objective function was just drag coefficient. It could be lift coefficient, it could be pitching moment. But it could also be, you know, a list of things like pitching moment, drag coefficient, um, lift coefficient. It can also be things like the loading, um, you know, or the pressure at every, you know, node or the span wise loading, um, you know, along a wing. So, you know, if you've got a wing that's defined by 20 different span wise stations, the code's going to come back with the integrated, you know, forces and moments for each one of those stations. Uh, you can now calculate, you know, the gradients of, say, the mesh nodes. Um, you know, basically the gradients of all those uh, spanwise lifter distributions with respect to the mesh nodes. Um, the user can pass in basically test vectors for both the solver and the adjoint GM road solves. This basically allows for you know, essentially implicit coupling of, you know, things like finite element solvers with the code um, as, you know, on both the, you know, solver level where you're basically trying to solve for, you know, a coupled, say, uh, arrow, uh, arrow elastic solution, um, but also on the adjoint side where you're then trying to op optimize that, you know, coupled finite element, you know, slash structures, uh, via Spiro solve. Um, user access to steady, time average, and unsteady um, objective functions and their gradients. So basically what that means is you can you can run both steady and unsteady uh, problems uh, using both obviously the solver, but now the adjoint method as well. Um, and you could come back with, you know, steady, obviously, uh, gradients for a steady state solution or time average gradients or if you want you can get basically the you know time accurate gradients at every time step and we will basically do almost the development of this on OS X and Linux so we have versions that are working and testing uh, been tested on those two platforms 
Um, Rob is working on getting it running on Windows. At this point, if you want to do it in Windows, your best bet is to install WSL and do it that way. Um, in development, uh, right now, the, the gradients are basically respect to the mesh nodes. Um, so, you know, X, Y, and Z for every node in your mesh. So if you've got a mesh of, you know, a, a thousand nodes, you've got, that means you've got 3,000 design variables, basically X, Y, and Z at every node. Um, and we come back with the gradients respect to that mesh. We're adding in um, basically all the solver inputs. So you'll be able to directly get partials of, say, CO respect to alpha, beta, mock, RPM, et cetera, for all the different types of, you know, inputs that you generally would run. Um, and so this will be nice because ultimately um, we'll be able to, to use all this to, to replace the finite difference thing we do for doing things like stability derivatives. Um, and then we're obviously working on trying to, to add in additional test cases to the distribution so that people can run those to make sure that, you know, they've got everything up and running correctly on their platform. So power rate. Uh, let's see. So the API. So basically, like I said, there, there's kind of two ways that you can run the solver and the edge joint. And I'm actually going to demo some of this in a little while here. But basically, in the in the lower left hand corner, you've basically got VSPRO, and this is how you know most of you who are just running the solver, whether you're doing it through the GUI or for the, the few of you that are doing it command line. Um, Basically, it's a compile of the solver using C++ doubles, and it just does everything like you'd expect it to do. The adjoint, um, basically, it's the exact same code base. I mean, literally, you, you type make, and it compiles the code and creates the solver, and then it goes back through the, the same exact code. Um, but now all the doubles are replaced with adept doubles. And, uh, and there's a couple of if defs and there's some paths to the code that only make sense for the adjoint, but it, it creates this adjoint solver that then will you know solve the adjoint equations that I talked about previously. And these are, are two separate executables that you can run on the command line. And so you can do the optimization that way if you wanted to. You, you run the solver, it generates, you know, you get a solution that writes out some files, and then you run the adjoint, it reads in those files, solves the adjoint equation, dumps out a file of the gradients. Um, the other way, which is actually a lot nicer uh, in my mind right now to run the code is through the API. So we basically wrap the solver on the left in the namespace, the solver on the right, or the, you know, the adjoint solver in the namespace and C++. We create libraries, um, and then those are called in, pulled into, you know, a new object, it's VSP optimizer. And this is the C++ API. I'll quickly kind of talk about that. Um, but it allows you basically to, you know, access and run the solver, access and run the adjoint, you know, all from C++ API calls. Um, and then as part of the release package, um, there's basically this simple little piece of code called BSPRO opt. Um, and, and that's just essentially an example on using the BSP optimizer API. So this basically has you know, like on the order, I think it's a half dozen test cases now. And that just runs uh, different test cases. So like a, a steady state wing, calculate the gradients and the solution and gradients on that. Uh, you know, a rotor case where it, it, you know, does an unsteady rotor calculation and then calculates the gradients for that. And then up in the right is the VSPRO complex version. Uh, so this is the complex step version. So it literally just replaces all the doubles in the solver with complex variables. Um, and then there's, a, you know, basically a little bit of an API, you know, I don't want to call it an API, but the ability to run this um, and, and do some test cases. Um, and like I said, right now, it's basically there to validate the adjoint process that we have. So, um, you know, this is a, doing the, the complex step is relatively simple in terms of the modifications to the code, um, but it's still very costly. Um, and I'll show you some examples of, of that in a little bit. So um, this is kind of, I'm going to go through this a little bit more, but this is just kind of 
stepping through that API. So there's a VSP optimizer class, and you know, don't worry about reading all this. But basically, it allows you to set up things. You know, basically the number of threads. Tell it you do, you know, unsteady analysis. Get back things like the number of loops and the nodes that are in your mesh. You can update the geometry. So if you're doing an optimization, you know, you can obviously go calculate the sol solution, calculate the gradients, do whatever your favorite, you know, optimizer is, whether it be steepest descent or conjugate gradient or SN opt, you know, whatever. Uh, and then you know you come up with a, a, an updated geometry. You can feed that back in, and then you know new, do another step of solve and gradient calculations. There's a whole list, and you know here just the start of it, of all the different objective functions. So CLCD, CMs, um, you know rotor, thrust and power coefficient, wing load. There's actually a few more now um, that are in there. Um, you basically, I, I'll, I'll show you an example of this, but you can basically, once you've got all this set up, you'll read in your, you, you know, basically tell it, give it the file name of the mesh, it reads that in, and then you can, you know, basically do a solve, oh, um, which basically would solve, do both the, you know, a solve, forward solve, and the adjoint solve. Um, if you just want to do it, you know, the forward solve and not the adjoint, you can do that. Um, you know, so there's cases where you want to do that. And then there's all just basically functions for getting back the objective function, whether or not they be scalars or vectors, um, whether they're steady state, time averaged, um, or time accurate. Um, you can get back, you know, obviously ping the mesh, get the gradients, and again, whether or not those gradients are basically, um, you know, with respect to some steady state um, or with respect to some time averaged or time accurate solution. So I'm going to talk to those a little bit more as we go through. Um, and so the rest of this, uh, timing is reasonably well, um, is basically going to be demo stuff. And so uh, definitely if folks have questions, um, you know, let them ask them, I guess. I mean, I, I would like to get through all these if possible, but it's not absolutely required. Um, I'm going to take this kind of in, you know, the viewpoint of how I run VSPiro. Um, so, you know, when you're running VSPiro with an open VSP, in reality, it's running the solver in the background um, as a separate process. And then, you know, reading in all the output files that VSPiro you know, provides and providing plots and all those results to you with an open VSP, which is really nice, obviously. Um, for a lot of the stuff I do, I'm basically doing things like optimization or I'm basically running, you know, generating databases and stuff like that where I've got scripts and I'm doing most of my work on the command line. So I just wanted to kind of go over that a little bit and just let people maybe be a little bit more aware of what's going on under the hood and, and what is there. And then I've got essentially kind of three sets of, uh, of demos, basically just the generic wing body tail and VOM and panel mode. And I just want to kind of talk about some of the things I look at when I'm running the code for either VOM or panel. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we added into the solver and viewer uh, in terms of panel mode and basically cut planes. Um, you know, Brandon likes that part. Um, and then finally, I go into the adjoint stuff um, and, and kind of maybe go a little bit deeper into that. So, generic wing body. So, um, you know, this basically pulled up OpenVSB, threw together a simple wing body with some tails. Uh, I'm going to kind of just talk about both the panel and VOM solve, probably in the opposite order. Talk a little bit about wakes and talk a little bit about pressures. Um, and the first thing on here, mesh spacing. Um, one of the things I, I, I see people do is like completely overkill, uh, you know, the basically how fine a mesh you're feeding into VSPRO. My general recommendation is go with as coarse as you know, you can. I mean, this this is, you know, I would not say this is like, you know, what I would recommend as a final mesh, but something like this or even a bit coarser on the wings and bodies is a good place to start. 
um, especially if you're running panel, but even if you're running Vortex Lattice, more often than not, you set up a problem, you know, uh, especially as a new user, there's some quirks in the way the solver works and the way OpenVSP works. And if you generate a really, really fine mesh, um, and if you have some numerical issues with the solve, it's just going to take forever to run. Um, so it's often a lot better just to go and generate coarse grids, run it and see what you get. And then you can start refining the mesh from there. Um, the other observation I'll just say is in general, um, if you've got a geometry like this, especially if you are you seem to be running into problems, the first thing to do is start getting rid of components in your analysis. So, you know, get rid of the tails um, and run it. Um, if you still have issues, get rid of the body and run it. Um, you know, hopefully at that point, the wing runs. Um, if not, then you know there's something wrong with the wing geometry and you can start looking at that. Um, but basically the idea is make the, make the model as, as simple as you can if you're having issues and, and make the mesh as coarse as you can initially just to, you know, get to the point where you actually have something running um, and running reasonably fast. So if you need to, you can do debugging reasonably fast. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see this, Brandon. Yeah, I can see your screen, Dave. I need to make the text bigger. I don't know. It's um, it's a little fuzzy on the projector. So unless there's something that you need to point out in the terminal, then you know, we can kind of see what's going on. Okay. So, um, you know, this is just that geometry that we had pulled up, right? And so there's two paths to writing this geometry out, basically the VOM as well as the panel. So I'm just going to go ahead and run the VOM first. But the first thing I want to do is, so, On the command line, if you just run VSPRO with like no command options, it will just, you know, barf out a bunch of stuff to you, right? So I basically just, you know, there's the path. I don't know how well you can see all this, but basically just the path to the executable, which is VSPRO on my machine. Um, Dave, can you blow that up just a little bit? I can certainly try. I don't think that's probably it. About as big as I'm going to be able to make it and still be able to see things on my side. <laughs> okay. So it's not so important that you actually, I mean, uh, yeah. the, the point is that if you basically run the command line option, uh, you know, just VSPRO without any options, it's going to write out what should be the latest, greatest list of all the command line options, right? So dash OMP is here, whether you can read that or not. You can basically specify the number of processors that you run in, in parallel. You can do dash dab to run a stability control, dash P stab to basically do a roll rate stability analysis, um, dash restart. There, there, you know, all of these different options with explanations of what they do. And, you know, you can run all these from the command line. And, and in fact, when you're running OpenVSP from the GUI, you know, a lot of these things, you know, it's basically this is what it's doing. Right? So these are all there. Um, they are, in a sense, undocumented, but they are documented if you actually just type VSP arrow and it will barf these out for you. And then, you know, it gives examples down the, at the bottom for, you know, how to run a geometry. So, like in this case, I'm, well, if you look, so there's that, you know, wing body tail, that VSPO geometry. Basically, when you write out a vortex lattice model, it basically writes out this wing body tail underscore degengeom dot CSV file, basically, which is the degenerate geometry information file. So, you know, I'm just going to run this on the command line. You know, 
know, it's basically doing three wake iterations. Um, and then going to view it. So it basically pops up. And you know, within viewer, just like you would have be launched from the GUI, you can see all the solutions. And so just a couple of things I wanted just to point out in general. Um, you know, typically like three wake iterations is good enough. I'm not sure what the default is in the GUI. I think it was five at one point. Usually I tend to just run three. Um, if you're running, you know, five and it's not converging, um, you know, if CL and CD are still bumping around, um, it's usually because you have some kind of an issue with the model, right? So you may have wakes impinging on other components um, in some strange way that the wakes are going unstable and it, it can't find a steady state solution. So um, you, know, you can obviously try to run more iterations, but you know, typically if it's taking more than three, surely more than five, it's probably worth your time to go in and look at things. Um, the other thing, I mean, the, the code showing this computational mesh for these different components, you've got two components here. You got the wing and the body that are basically planar. You've got the horizontal tail that's planar with part of the fuselage surfaces. Um, the code tries to, to deal with that. You know, numerically, it's not the best thing in the world to do, but the code should deal with it. But there'll still be times where you might have uh, strange intersections, especially in the vortex lattice models where these are all separate components that really don't know about each other, you know, except through the full solve in the end. Um, so when you've got these overlapping, essentially planar type components, um, they can sometimes cause problems. So that's just something to look at and think about. Um, I'd say 95% of the time the code deals with it just fine. Um, and so yeah, so that's kind of just running that from the command line. Um, you know, there's going to be more examples of that. And then moving over to the panel. Um, when you run, you know, right out, do a comp geom and right out, um, in this case, a VSP geom, you're going to get just, you know, a wing body tail VSP geom file um, if you're running with you know, possibly the cart 3D outputs, you'll get a dot .try file. They basically have very similar type information, but like I said, we're, we've moved to VSP John as default file format for the uh, panel solves, just because it, it contains a lot more information that Rob can figure out on his side, as opposed to me trying to figure out on my side, just from the triangulation. Um, oh, there was actually something I wanted to show, so I'm gonna move that. Um, the information, so when you run the code, there's a bunch of output files, whether you run the VLM or run the panel. And so the history file basically has the results of the calculation. So we had three wing iterations. We had mock number, angle of attack, slide slip angle, then it has the, basically the history of CL, CD, um, and so this is, you know, there's CDI and CDT, and you'll see those reported. So CDI is that value I mentioned before is calculated from the kind of Joukowsky theorem. CDT is basically doing that trailing edge slash truss plane type analysis. Um, and you can see here for this simple geometry, they're, they're very close um, and, and they should be for a, a geometry this simple, especially on, you know, uh, the vortex lattice solve. And so that geometry, that, that file's there. The other one that's going to be of interest is the load file. So there's a, you know, dot LOD file, and this is what's being plotted when you look in at loading information. So this information, it's, you know, it's all in there in, in text files. So you basically got, you know, wing one, wing two, wing three, wing four, wing five. So these are basically, you know, the surfaces. So you've got wings, the tail, the vertical tail, and then you've got the fuselage or the different components, different surfaces that they're on. So these are basically just like CLCD, you know, as a function of span, for instance. And then down here is just the integrated forcing moments for each one of these components. So like you could go into the wing and there's basically, you know, a left and right surface. Um, and you've got the CL on those two surfaces that induce drag, you know, the side forces, it's opposite equal. 
um, et cetera. So we're going to go into the panel solve. So again, on the panel solve, you basically just do the same thing. In the solver, I'm running it with four processors on this machine. So if you know you watched how fast the VOM solve went by, this took a little bit longer. You know, this took like on the eight or eight seconds. I think you know the VOM solve was probably like less than a second, right? Um, so panel solves generally, you know, there's more panels. Um, and it's a stiffer set of equations, so they're generally going to take longer to, to solve those equations. So there's one more reason why I would generally say start with the vortex lattice model to begin with. So a couple things. So I wanted to point out, um, and it's one of the things where there was actually a bug in the version that's out there right now on that Rob, had, Rob and I will, I'll get an update out. but. Um, you know, generally, so you've got the the pressure distribution. Obviously, it's the full thick up panel geometry, and it's the vortex lattice. So the difference here, obviously, is that you get pressures on the lower and upper surfaces, not just the delta pressure through a thin surface. The fuselage obviously is modeled as you know a full 3D geometry, so you're going to get the effects of the fuselage more accurately modeled on the full field of the wing and the tails. Um, and then just one little thing that I wanted to point out. So you can you can see where basically these vortex lines are being shed off the trailing edge. Um, and the version out there will accidentally on some geometries throw one right here at the root junction of the uh, intersection of the, of the root and the body, and it shouldn't be. But um, one thing when you're running panel solves, um, right? So, you know, you basically define these wings, define the fuselage in terms of, you know, the number of points in U and V directions. And you're usually not thinking about it, but, you know, you've got a cross section here. The next cross section of this wing was inside the body. But it's entirely possible, depending on the spacing that you have in the span wise direction, that you could have a cross section here, a cross section here. Maybe the next cross section is like right there, you know. And so you'd see a you know a, a wing cross section, you know, basically running you know up the quarter of the wing, very very close to the fuselage. And in fact, you know, if you're unlucky, it could be essentially some very very small distance away from the fuselage. And then it's going to shed a wake off of that. And I know the flight stream guys have kind of the same issue. Um, you're going to start having numerical issues if you start shedding wakes that are like really, really close to the body. And so generally speaking, um, you know, try to not do that. Um, we probably need to, to, to work on something to, to catch that more automatically in the code um, and warn you at least. But right now, uh, I just want to toss that out there because it's one of those things that I see people do. Um, and, and and it's an easy one to fix, but it may not be an easy one to, to notice. All right. Um, if, if you look at all this, all the same kind of files are written out, that history file, the loading file. So one of the things we did add, and it again, it works best with VSP Geom, is that we provide loading data not only for the vortex lattice solves, but now also for the panel solves. So you can take a look at this file and I'm going to assume it's also parsed in the GUI. I'll let Rob answer that if he wants. Um, but basically, again, here we've got for the wings and the tails, you've got basically the spanwise loading for all the lifting type components um, for this panel solve. And that was not something we had in the past. Um, and it was something that was, you know, highly uh, requested. And so, uh, it was actually a lot of changes on the hood to do that. And a lot of it relies on the stuff that, that Rob did for VSP job. So I, I thank you for that. All right. So um, next thing. So uh, just back to that FT F15 ish model. Um, just wanted to, to highlight a few things that, that we've added to the viewer. Um, probably be pointed out later, but my chance to take credit. 
So um, I'm not going to solve this. Basically, it's just the F15 case. So I've already got the solution sitting around. Yeah, cool. So it's just a half span model. It's the panel model. So we turn on the pressures. All this is the same. We can turn on the drawing wakes. If you don't know that you can actually turn the draw the wakes as lines or points or both. So you can make pretty pictures like that. And the thing that we've added in there is basically this tab over here, of cutting points. So there's a default stuff for the solution. You click on cutting points. Um, Basically, in the input file to VS Bureau, you can specify cutting points. So here we've got a Y cut point, so a Y cut value of zero. So this is basically a cutting point that's draw, you know, cut through the solution down the symmetry plane um, of, of the flow field. And it then calculates, uh, you know, basically at the center of each of these quads, um, basically the, the velocity field and backs out from that the pressures. Um, and you can have as many cutting points as you want. So like we have another one here, which is an X cutting point at a value of, of X equals 60. So again, I mean, these high spikes here is basically the, the vortex coming you know, off this wing, wing tip vortex. You've got really high velocities there and the pressures. Um, and then the last thing that goes on with this is that along with basically plotting the pressures. You can basically also look at the velocity vectors. You know, this is getting hidden. So you can scale those velocity vectors. So I, I try to take a stab at basically scaling them to some reasonable value, but you could, if you have like a couple points where you have sort of really huge velocities or something like that, the default might not be the best, but you can basically play around with scaling those vectors just to kind of, you know, understand what the flow field's doing. Um, so, you know, this makes for pretty pictures, obviously. Um, but this information is is basically also there for you if, you know, you're basically want to interrogate that flow field for some other reason. I mean, you might be wanting to do store separation analyses. You might want to just be comparing to wind tunnel data, um, whatever. Um, all of this data is written out to a text file. So basically, there's you know unstructured, you know, kind of a quad tree type mesh data structure that's written out. All the coordinates for these quads, and then basically the solution that's attached to all of these quads is there. So you can basically interrogate this data on your own if you can pulled it into whatever little piece of software you want. So, all right. That's all I wanted to show on the map. Why this keeps jumping to another desktop. That's, so I got like a, about a half hour, right, Brandon? Let's see. Yeah, we got about a half hour left. Uh, does anybody in the room have questions where you want to Take a break and poke a little bit, or you want to let him keep going? You have a question? So, uh, Dave, the, the question was regarding that uh, wing body tail model where you were talking about where to place that cross section close or at least a little bit distant from the body. Um, can you elaborate just a little bit about what you meant or um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. show an example just to, to yeah. highlight what it is that you meant? Let me pull it up. Just in the wrong directory. All right, so let me make this a little bit bigger. Maybe. So, uh, mm. all right, so. 
you know, if you look at it in hidden line view, um, you can see, you know, basically you've got these cross sections, um, you know, defining the wing in the span wise direction. And, you know, if we just go back to wire, you can see, like, you know, there's a cross section there, there's a next cross section. And if you can kind of see it, maybe I'll go and change the red. So you can see, you know, cross section, cross section outside the fuselage, next cross sections inside the fuselage. All right. So uh, if we go in and let's just pump this up to cross sections. All right. Now we go in and let's. Do in line. I mean, this is actually not that bad. All right. So that I mean, that's bad enough. Right, so you 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 have all these cross sections. You know they're in this case evenly spaced. Um, I mean, you could do some other kind of spacing. You know, typically you're going to space them so you got finer distribution of that middle tip. But you know you've got essentially these evenly spacing, even spacing. So if you know you call this delta s, same delta s, same delta s. This last line right here that's defining your wing, and then the next cross section that's inside. Right, so if we go and, and actually run this intersection, um, this last cross section that's defining your wing in the span wise direction is very close, at least in terms of the spacing of the mesh spacing here to the, the side of the fuselage. And so by default, the code's going to shed a vortex, a train vortex from you know, all of these points along the wing, right? including this one right here that's quite close to the fuselage. Um, and, and this one's not, you know, horribly close, um, but, you know, generally speaking, I would try just to avoid that, you know, and, and tweak the spacing so that that point either moves over here or pops inside, right? And so I, that if, you know, it changes to 30, you know, so you actually get, you know, one more point, a boom, that point pops inside. And now you're just going to have, you know, nice spacing and then the spacing between the, you know, last vortex being shed and the fuselage is similar to the spacing of, you know, between all the vortices, right? As opposed to the, the case where this was 29, you know, yeah, the spacing is the same, but the spacing between it and the fuselage is really, really quite tight. And what's going to happen, you're going to get really high induced velocities coming off of, you know, this shed vortex at the root because the load's dropping. Um, and then that vortex filament that, you know, that trailing vortex that's coming back, it's trying to stay parallel, you know, and it, it basically to the flow that's going on the surface. Um, but, you know, if this paneling is, you know, coarser and different than the spacing of the trailing edge nodes coming off the trailing edge wake, then you can easily have cases where this fort trying vortex here basically will basically start oscillating, um, maybe impinging going inside the fuselage and, uh, and just generally, you know, causing kind of numerical havoc. Um, so just kind of best processes, I, I try to avoid those cases if possible. And I think, you know, the, the flight stream guys, I know in the past that they've had tools to basically, you know, kind of like basically Tell the solver not to, to throw a, a, a wake line off, off that, a point like that. Um, I thought this one's necessarily horrible. I mean, there's still a reasonable space, but I, I would just best practices this nudge that, you know, with the spacing so that it disappears entirely. Um, all right. And so it doesn't mean you can't have a fine mesh that approaches the surface. It's just, you know, at some point, um, you know, if it's too fine and it's too close, you're going to end up with you know, numerical issues of that first trailing vortex coming off at the moon. Thanks, Dave. We have one more. Is there yeah, it's the, so they were asking if it's if it's specifically the trailing edge point that needs to be buried in the fuselage or have that spacing. That's that's correct, right, Dave? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah thank like you. Like I said, I, I, you know, looking at it like that versus, you know, boom, I just, bump, you know, added another cross section and basically popped it inside, right? So it's just really that trailing edge point. You really just don't want a wake uh, coming off that point. I mean, in theory, if, if we had the capability of either in the GUI or one way or the other, just to tell the solver not to, to shed a wake off that point would be another way to deal with it. Um, right now, I don't have that capability of the user to tell the solver not to do that. So I just try to like basically do it this way by not having the point there. Um, but that's probably like one of, of all the things that people have issues with, that's one of the things I just notice because it's not an obvious thing. All right, so I'm going to move to the joint. So add joint. So um, yeah, yeah, lots of time. So I'm going to basically just kind of step through these first off. Uh, and then if we got time at the end, I'll actually like kind of run the demos. Um, but I, I do want to just kind of like talk about the slide to the slides at least. Um, so uh, just adjoint basically a generic wing, um, the design variables, or well, the objective function is CL, the design variables are the mesh nodes. So this had you know 387 nodes defining the mesh. There's an X, Y, Z location for every node, so that gives you 1161 sign variables. Um, there's two ways, again, to solve this. I'll, I'll talk about both of those um, once we get into kind of the demo, but basically there's the two-step solve. So basically, you know, you, you saw run VSBRO, um, you know, like you would normally on the command line or maybe through the GUI if you're doing it that way. And you basically, you know, tell it you're doing a dash op, tells us to do an optimization. You have to tell it what optimization function that one happens to correlate to with coefficient. And then this is just a simple Hershey bar wing. Um, and then after that's done, you run the uh, adjoint solver. Um, tell it you're doing an adjoint. Um, it's an optimization problem, same optimization function. It basically reads in the solution that VSPRO wrote out and then so it solves the adjoint equations and then it'll dump out the gradients of basically partial CO with respect to all the mesh nodes. Um, and then you could do the same problem basically through the C plus API. Um, uh, and then, you know, obviously we mentioned the complex step uh, version of the code and so we make use of that to basically validate the process. So um, there's basically just a, you know a simple Hershey bar ring. Um, basically, like I said, you know you, we're just running this um, to to calculate the gradients, partial CO, respect the mesh nodes. Um, we can run this basically you know with the complex step version of the code, and that basically just perturbs each node kind of in a finite difference standpoint, but it's doing it on the complex, the imaginary part of of the the complex double. Um, to essentially get kind of a finite difference result back, but without all the Randolph error issues. Um, and so, you know, you've got uh, 357 nodes, you've got, you know, three, you got XYZ for each one of those nodes. You have to run the solver, you know, 357 times three times um, using, the, you know, running the complex step. That takes 872 seconds um, and you get back the gradients of CO with respect to X, Y, and Z for every node. Or you can run the adjoint. In this case, it was done with the API. Um, and this is all done on my laptop. Um, and it took about three seconds. So in this case, it's on the order of you know, 300 times faster. And in general, it's going to scale with the, you know, kind of the, the number of, of uh, independent variables that you have to calculate gradients against. Dave, AJ has a question. In this context, objective function. Yeah, so AJ was asking if the objective function was basically just a variable that you want gradients uh, with respect to. So one in this case was CL, right? Yeah, yeah. So sorry. I, yeah, that's a basic objective function here was CL. Um, so these are all the partials of CO respect to the mesh nodes, right? So like if you look at mesh node one, the end result of this is that, you know, the partial of CO respect to essentially a perturbation of node one in X, Y, and Z, and then repeat that for all of the nodes, all right? 
Uh, and so I think I had a typo. I think it's, it's three eight. Oops. Ah, sorry about that. My bad. Um, yeah, so you know, there's 357 nodes, uh, and then so this first chart is just you know, F is in this case CL, so it's partial of CL with respect to the X location of each node, and these spikes are basically the leading and showing edges of the wing. So basically, it's you know, as you kind of would expect, you know, tweaking the leading and showing edge of the wing has a larger impact on CL than tweaking kind of an interior node. Um, but this is this partial of, of CL respect to you know, perturbation of all the nodes respect to X, then respect to Y and respect to Z. The symbols, the circles are the complex step results. And then there's actually two sets of lines and you can only really see kind of like one of them, which is the green, which is the adjoint run in API mode, but the adjoint run in two-step mode is, is sitting right under, you get the identical results. Um, the API, API runs ever so slightly faster and, you know, from kind of probably an optimization standpoint is, is where you want to be because then you could basically integrate that code, you know, at the C++ level with whatever your optimizer is, as opposed to having something that basically has to do system calls and, and run the solver and then read in, you know, text files and stuff like that. Um, so the API code, like I said, you know, I, I showed before, you know, how you would run it basically in the two-step run the solver. On the on the API side, basically, um, you create, you know, a VSP optimizer object. Uh, in this case, I'm telling it to use four threads to to do this. The forward solve, the adjoints is going to do single solve, a uh, single processor for now. Uh, it's this you know unsteady analysis is zero by default. That's it. But setting telling it's a, it's you know you know not doing a, a, a time accurate analysis. Number of optimization functions is one. You you could have a list. So like you have CL, CD, CM, da 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 da, and it, it'll basically just chug over all of them, solve the adjoint three times, um, you know, and come back with the partials of those uh, in respect to the mesh for you know say CL, CD, CM. So you can do all that in one one, one setup. Um, and then you give it basically a file name, you know, and in this case it would be in the, the Hershey, it was the name of the, of the geometry. Um, and then you just tell it to do a solve. And at that point, it basically just goes off, runs the forward solve, then runs the adjoint solve. And then like I showed before in the API, you have access to, you know, the gradients and the objective function um, or functions. Um, if this was a vector, you would have, you know, access to a vector of objective functions. Um, say like the spanwise distribution of you know lift, um, and then you'd have the gradients uh, respect uh, of of that respect to the mesh. Um, yeah, so here just again like you know you've got that optimizer object that we've created. You can basically grab get function value. Um, we only had one function, but nonetheless you you know you basically can call it generically. Just in this case, p is just one gets the function values, that would be CL, and then just a loop, just writing out to a text file as an example, basically the, the nodes of the mesh and the gradients of, you know, partial CL with respect to X, Y, and Z for each of the nodes for, you know, each of our uh, optimization objective functions. In this case, it's just that one CL. So again, that's all in C++, and I, I think I, I had a bullet up there, and, and I, 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 I didn't, I don't think I spoke to it, but uh, Daniel Ingram, which I assume is there, um, has been, you know, working with this uh, under the OpenMDO project, and uh, he has been, you know, helping a lot to basically, you know, get, test this out, and more importantly, to get it into OpenMDO um, and have a Python wrap around this. So if you would prefer to deal with a Python API, that will be available in the near future, thanks to Daniel. If you're like me, stick with the C++. Um, so generic rotor, I think I, I don't know why I fixed CD, but I did. Um, basically this got, you know, the, um, you basically, uh, it's a, it's a, you'll, you'll see the, the, the geometry in a bit. It's, it's actually a single rotor, single, single bladed rotor, and that was basically just so it runs fast. Um, but there's basically, you know, 289 nodes, so about 860-ish 
design variables. Again, you can run two step or you could do an API and then we do a comparison with the complex step. So uh, just I'm going to call it the API. So it looks very much the same as before, except now we're doing an unsteady analysis. Again, everything else is here is the same. Um, I just have an example here where you could supply in a, a you know a user defined gradient vector. I'm not going to go into why you'd want to do that. Um, Daniel and Tim understand why you want to do that, but it, it's all there. It, it basically allows you to, to couple both the edge joint um, and, and the forward solve with with other codes in an implicit manner. Um, so you can you can basically do you know tightly coupled say structures arrow solves for both the forward and the edge joint. Uh, so again, like 289 nodes, like I said, it's a single single bladed rotor, um, and mostly because when you run this on my laptop and with complex step, it you know it takes nearly two and a half hours to chug through all the gradients, right? So it's running this 289 times three times to do the complex step, and it's an unsteady time accurate analysis. It's it's only doing two rotations of the rotor blade, which probably really isn't enough, but it's good enough to validate the adjoint. Running the adjoint for the same problem takes 21 seconds on my laptop, um, so it's like 400 times faster. And so you can start to see why you'd want to have the adjoint capability. Um, you know, either, whether it be a steady state or or a, an unsteady problem. Um, you know, 21 seconds versus 2.35 hours is a huge difference. And if you're into pain. You could add in another two rotors, and literally it's just three times the mesh nodes. Um, so you know, you look at this, and you're like, "Oh, it's just three times the mesh nodes," but it's three times the mesh nodes. Um, and so you've got to perturb three times as many cases, and then it's well, it's three times as many mesh nodes. So each solve takes on the order of three times longer that n log n thing. Um, so it you know takes on the well, on the order of you know nine to ten hours long or nine to ten times longer than the previous case. Um, I didn't really want to kill my laptop, so I bumped this over to my Linux box, which is actually slower per processor. But it, it chugged in the complex step uh, method to do all of these. Took a good sixty hours with four processors. Um, it took two hundred ish seconds on the same machine using the adjoint via the API. And so it's on the order of 1,000 times faster. Um, on my laptop, it actually runs in like 100 seconds um, using four processors as well. Um, and again, the, you know, the charts on the left are always been basically in this case, the, you know, the partial CD with respect to X, Y, and Z for each of the nodes. So all of this is there. There's a C++ API. Um, there's going to be a Python API. Um, these examples will be up there uh, as well as others um, to basically build upon um, both to just test out your, you know, your version of the code wherever you basically compiled or, or and running it, and also just uh, to help you get set up and doing, you know, your your own problem. So. Actually, yeah, I forgot. There's one more thing, but one thing I, before I do that. Uh, so, in terms of the API, um, you know, obviously the code is always there, and when people ask me to, you know, how do you do this, I always say go look at the code. So, uh, yeah, go look at the code. But um, I am actually working on documentation for everything. So we've got Doxygen running. Um, I've been. The code is actually pretty well commented, but it just wasn't necessarily set up for doxygen. So like this is the, the VSPRO optimizer class. Uh, so basically there's the beginning of, you know, basically all the public API stuff here is, is documented at a fairly high level. You know, there's some of the other stuff. It's uh, like VSP Edge, some of the other stuff. So if you want to go in there and kind of look at the core stuff where it calculates, you know, basically the downwash. For each edge, uh, you know, all the API stuff is there um, called out in the documentation that, you know, basically there's both HTML and LaTeX. So that that's all there. And then there's a 30 document that's being worked on as well. So all that will 
ultimately end up in the distribution, I hope. So. Round of applause and cheers from the room, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's not there, it's in the code. Uh, so one more thing, just because uh, I think, you know, the flight stream guys can, can, I think, understand this. You know, for many years, uh, well, panel codes kind of, you know, were a bad word. Um, and, you know, CFD was the thing and OVO and Ivor Stokes. And, you know, higher order panel methods were the thing. Um, and, you know, flight streams formulation, well, not exactly the same as ours. I mean, the, the thing that they have going is that they're, they're basically lower order panel methods, right? So, you know, basically just, you know, vortex, I, I call them ring, but, you know, it, it's not, you know, your typical, like, you know, VS arrow where you've got basically doublets and, you know, source constant panels, or if you go all the way up to pan error where you've got like, you know, higher order doublets and source distributions. And those codes were, were really quite complex, both, you know, mathematically, numerically, but also were just the pain in the butt to get geometry into. Um, and so, you know, between flight stream and, and VSPRO, and, and there's a few other codes out there that are kind of doing some of the similar stuff nowadays. Um, you know, we can get, you know, pretty complex geometry in there by going with unstructured meshes. We're using, you know, fairly, you know, quote unquote, low order panels. And I think, you know, we're getting, you know, doing a good job. But the, the one thing that, you know, supposedly we, we, we couldn't do is supersonics for, for panels. Um, like I mentioned, for, for Vortex Lattice, the, the code runs fine for supersonic Vortex Lattice. Um, Vorview, which was based on uh, Lockheed's Vorlax, which was basically written by Miranda and others at Lockheed. The theory behind Vorlax, a lot of the, the underlying equations are basically what is the basis for the equations that I solve in VSPRO. And those equations take into account basically panel glider transformations, and they're valid for both subsonic and supersonic flow fields. And Vorlax was a sub or supersonic vortex lattice method. And from the get-go, VSPRO has also been a sub and supersonic vortex lattice method, but for panels, it was just subsonic. So mostly because I was told it wouldn't work, I made it work. Um, so I, you know, Backing up, I've improved the accuracy and stability of the supersonic vortex lattice. That's something that just kind of came out of, of me pounding my head a lot on the table, trying to get something working for panel. And so now we have some very, very, very preliminary support for supersonic panel solves. Um, it only works for sharp leading edges. So, you know, don't go and, you know, put your uh, space shuttle blunt leading edges and stuff like that in there. It's, it's not going to work. Or if it works, you're going to get the wrong answer. Um, wings generally work. Again, this is like kind of alpha-ish stage. Um, bodies work, but um, and, and, and theoretically they, 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 they are working just fine, but numerically there's like some work that needs to be done to basically solve on body type meshes more accurately. So um, take so so you could do wing body geometries. I have done wing body geometries. Um, but the solutions on the bodies uh, need need some work. Um, it took a while to figure out what to do, to be honest. Um, but it all comes down to the principal part of influence integral, which if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, but it, it literally ends up changing like a few lines of code um, and some of the logic in terms of how that principal part of the influence integral is calculated um, for panel solves. Um, and once I kind of figured out that it just started working, there really is no other changes to the core solver at all. Um, that all said, if you're doing supersonic calculations, the VLM mode is still recommended. So this is just, you know, my generic test case. Um, this is just a 45 degree sweep delta wing. Uh, it's this really way too thick biconvex airfoil, but I kind of wanted to push things and compare against CART 3D, which is an oiler solver. Um, 
and you know if I'm doing super thin the stuff, then I could just go with you know VOM. So I was just like, well, let's just make it twenty percent. So the solutions are basically over there on the right. So that's just the top and bottom uh, pressure distributions. Um, you know, it's barely, basically, you know, really, you know, constant states, right? So you, you know, as you would su suspect, you should be getting from basically a linear supersonic panel type solvent. And then the charts on the left are basically just slices. So there's y over b of 0 0.25 all the way up to 0.9. So this is basically just center line out to near the tip. And VSPRO is in the magenta, so upper left. Um, just shows like the center line slice there, VSPRO solutions, CP versus X. And then CAR 3D, which is a unstructured Cartesian Euler solver, which is actually a really nice solver, right? Um, it's, it's relatively fast, even for the supersonic cases where, you know, it's not doing multi-grid anymore, but it just chugs. Um, so, it's, you know, um, in you know, so I don't, you don't expect exact uh, comparison between the two. Uh, CAR3D is solving essentially the full up uh, Euler equations. If you go in, and I, I thought I had the charts that had actually the linear theory solutions on there, I guess I grabbed the wrong ones. But if you plot up basically what you expect from linear theory, uh, VSPRO is basically kind of returning what you'd expect from, you know, swept linear theory. Um, whereas CAR3D is kind of capturing, there's basically kind of a, even though it's a sharp leading edge, there's still kind of a small subsonic kind of bow shockish region out there just because of the way it, it treats that that mesh up there. Um, but you know generally speaking the the it's it's promising. I again I would say this is more a proof of concept than anything else. But the code runs, it converges um, and it returns back, you know, kind of what I would expect it to um, on these type of meshes for wings anyway, for for bodies, there's some work to be done. Um, yeah. Dave, we had a question in the room. Mark. Yeah. Question? Yeah, the question is, why was it so difficult to get uh, supersonics to work on a thick surface panel code? Uh, you know, because I'm stupid, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. I mean, when you look at what the answer was, it was a trivial change, right? But um, and I kind of figured it was something like that. But I, you know, until I kind of just sat there and and stared at it for long enough. But it, it basically comes down to kind of uh, zones of influence. So the the vortex lattice method, right? You got thin surfaces. Um, there really is no upper and lower surface, right? You've got this thin camber line representation of, you know, your your surface, be it a wing or or, or cruciform fuselage, um, and so, you know, there's just one surface. There's not an upper surface. There's not a lower surface, um, and so the at the leading edge. You know that that leading edge basically. You know again, there's no upper and lower surface. Now, as where I actually proved to myself that this was doable, basically I, I took two vortex lattice representations, essentially for this geometry or something similar to it. Um, so basically, a vortex lattice model for the upper surface and a vortex lattice for the model for the lower surface, and the code ran fine. Right. It gave you delta CPs, which is what, really what you wanted, but it basically ran and it proved to me that numerically the problem is well posed. And so it really came down to how to treat that leading edge. And so if you look at the, you basically have this integral over each vortex loop and, you know, for subsonic flows, Every, it looks like a Biot Servalt kind of calculation. For supersonic flows, it looks something similar, but the zone of dependence is within the Mach cone, except when you approach the vortex filament itself and the vortex loop that it is attached to. So basically, as you kind of approach, get closer and closer to the actual vortex filament um, and looking at its basically the downwash that it induces on itself. And then the integral basically goes singular and you have to do all this fun math. 
and basically take the Hadamard, you know, principal part of the integral. And if you're in a vortex lattice code and you're at a vortex filament at the leading edge, it's the vortex filament for the you know leading edge, essentially for the upper and lower surface. There really isn't an upper and lower surface, but there's a single surface and you have a single vortex filament and it, you know, and, and everything works great. If you're in panel mode and you've got a sharp geometry like this one, and you've got a vortex filament that it is part of the leading edge, that very sharp leading edge, that vortex filament is basically tied to two different panels. Um, it's tied to uh, you know, a vortex loop that's on the upper surface, and it's tied to a vortex loop that's on the lower surface. And you need to calculate the influence of that you know, vortex filament on those two panels. And what it comes down to is that you need to treat those essentially as two separate panels. Because um, it's really, you know, there's a, a vortex strength associated with the upper loop, there's a vortex strength associated with the lower loop, and then there's a delta strength that's associated with that vortex filament that shares those two loops. And when you calculate that principal part of Hadamard's integral, you don't want to use the delta. You want to use just the value for the upper surface when you're doing the upper surface integral and you want to use the value of the circulation for the lower surface when you're doing the lower surface integral. So it's literally, like I said, it's a couple of lines of code that basically adds that logic in and it just works. If you don't do that, uh, if you can even get it to converge, you'll get a completely just makes no sense answer. Um, if you do that trivial thing, um, you get an answer and you have to and, and basically the, the, the way I deal you, you have to kind of deal the same thing when you've got like a fuselage or a pointy nose. Um, and so uh, and that's where I'm still working out some of the details on how to numerically kind of do that the most accurately. Um, and it, so it's a little bit more complex when you've got essentially kind of an axis metric flow, but it's the same idea. Um, maybe more detailed than people want. Thanks, Dave. So that's all I have. So um, I think I, I hit it pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, that was like right at 90 minutes. That was great. And right on time. Uh, any other uh, follow up questions in the room now that uh, Dave's kind of wrapped up? Yep, here. Just kind of curious. So the the question, so how far into supersonic would you stop trusting the solution? Yeah, so the question is, you know, when you're dealing with supersonics in VLM mode, about how far would you say it'll go before the solution starts to become untrustworthy? I mean, it's going to depend on your geometry. Um, I mean, if for VLM, I mean, in theory, you could run it up, you know, to Mach 10 or 20, and it's going to give you an answer. Um, I, you know, for the pressure distribution, it's, it, at some point, it's the codes, it's going to become very, very stiff. So, you know, I would say, you know, much more than Mach 5 or something like that, you, you're probably going to be hard pressed to, to get good solutions with a typical mesh that's coming out of, of open VSP. That, I mean, if, if we had more control of the mesh, you could probably push that up to maybe like, you know, Mach 10 or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, for the for the VOM though, I mean, you know, at some point you, it's just the delta CPs are going to be reasonable, but you know, I don't know. There, there's so many other things that at a, on a Mach five plus vehicle that are probably going to be like kind of wrong um, that you might care about. So, I mean, I've run cases with the old four lax code that were in the Mach, you know, five six range, and compared to you know, integrated force and moments from both wind tunnel and CFD. And, you know, for simple geometries, you know, I could say, you know, delta wing fighter-ish type geometries, it does amazingly good for, you know, CL and CD um, and even things like control surface deflections. Um, I think above Mach 5, I don't have a whole lot of experience in pushing these kind of codes 
beyond that, I mean, that's certainly something maybe we can take a look at if we had some test cases. Um, hey, yeah. Do you want to take this opportunity to, to pitch CB Arrow and its future availability? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, CB Arrow is still, I mean, it's available. It's, it's uh, so, I mean, the other code that I work on, um, it's actually in the NASA software catalog. It's available in general to like US citizens and companies. CBRO is an engineering level tool for doing hypersonic analysis. So it's in some sense, it's similar to the VSPRO. You basically feed it an unstructured geometry. So it's more like the panel type geometry, not the vortex lattice. Um, and, you know, it is actually on the hypersonic side. So, you know, it's perfectly happy running Mach 30, 40, you know, Mach 25 is bread and butter. Um, it's when you start getting down below like Mach 5 that we start questioning CBRL results. And it's based on modified Newtonian type methods. So, you know, and, and usually that's kind of like the crossover point, usually like in that Mach 5-ish range, and it kind of depends on the geometry. We've pushed it down even further than that. Um, but, you know, kind of like Mach 5 and above is where we start saying you know, modified Newtonian methods start working really, really well in terms of pressure distributions. And CBR also, you know, feeds back things like the aerothermal environment, so heating and all that kind of stuff, um, which is important when you're doing Mach 25 coming back like the shuttle or, or, or Orion. And, and then at the lower Mach numbers, you know, we would go, you know, if we were doing something, uh, you know, where we have the actual geometry, you know, we might go and, and jump to, to CART 3D because um, we actually feed in the exact same type meshes. Um, and then there's a way to bridge the solutions between the two. Um, you know, my hope for all this stuff is that with the panel stuff that, you know, we could get, you know, a panel solve that, you know, maybe gets up to those Mach 5 cases that's yet to be shown. Um, and, you know, have some alternative to something like CART 3D, which is a great code and if you can get it, but it does need more computational resources than a panel solve. But you obviously get, you know, a full OER solve out of it. Um, and, and we use it all the time. Um, so, you know, definitely take a look at CART 3D if that's something, you know, you're looking in that supersonic range for a full up geometry. Don't know if that actually answered your question. Yeah, I've uh, got another one. Yeah. So the, the question is whether VSPRO as it is now models something like uh, Osprey. The V2, we're talking V22? The V22? Yeah. Yep. I mean, I've never run the V22, but yeah, you could, you could do it. Um, in theory, you could do it in the panel mode. Um, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're, you're, I mean, okay, so uh, you could run it steady state with the actuator disk. You could run it, I didn't talk about it here. We've got the, the quasi unsteady mode for, you know, the rotors, and then you could run the full up time accurate mode with the rotors. Um, you could, in theory, run that with the panel. It would be expensive. Um, you could definitely run it with the vortex lattice models. Um, which would be, you know, where I would start. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes. Um, I think, you know, the goal, like we had mentioned, to be able to do thick thin is to be able to to kind of be able to do problems like that, where you know you might actually want to model the fuselage as a thick surface, but not pay the computational cost to model the wings and the rotors as thick surfaces, and just model those as essentially vortex lattice models. And so I think we're really close to being able to do that. Um, so I, I would say probably the next major release that that kind of stuff will be in there. Um, but yeah, you could definitely do geometries like that, uh, certainly with the vortex lattice mode. And and um, while I haven't done anything specifically like that with the panel, you know, it should work, but it would be just computationally a lot more expensive. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else? Just briefly. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. I know that was uh, a lot of material to cover, and uh, I'm glad you were able to join in virtually to present at the workshop. I uh, hope everything's going well out there, and we uh, we really appreciate you taking the time, man. Yeah, thank you for letting me dial in virtually. Yeah, so thanks. Appreciate it.